Okay. Um, well, I'd like to welcome Lee Meravai Harrington, um, who, uh, uh, welcome Lee. It's so lovely and such an honor to speak with you. I love your music. I just want to begin this by saying I love your music. Um, it's very uh, resonating, uh, mm -hmm. profound. It, it puts one into a different, more spacious, you know, more authentic space, I find. Thank you. So yeah, um, we worked hard to uh, kind of make sure that you know whatever vibration went into the music, and by that I mean like you know in the recording experience, we you know, we would always do certain. I was lucky to work with a producer who's also a, a yogi a practitioner. He's a kind of a new Buddha Buddhist practitioner, but he's very steeped in his own tradition. And so, I'm trying to remember, we would do the King of Aspiration prayers together before recording. And, you know, we just really, and then some Vajrasattva. And if we had any kind of residual kalashas, you know, sometimes you, you go in, like a studio is a workspace in a way. And any of us humans can go into a workspace carrying, you know, residual, you know, anger or worry about something or you know just our minds right so yes um, and i was very concerned about making sure that that didn't seep into any of the recordings that we were doing so you know again just very conscious we had pictures of his holiness karmapa all over the studio and, and the producers teachers pictures were everywhere and you know doing certain prayers and obstacle clearing and so I, I am glad to hear that that translates. It very much uh, does. I uh, yeah. I think that that uh, yeah. I think that's that's why it has such an authenticity to it, uh, to your music. Um, so uh, you very kindly um, allowed us to use excerpts uh, of three of your songs. In the documentary Beyond Two Worlds, Charlie Kyabgon Rinpoche the Ninth, um, and they were in very inspiring to us. And I wonder if you wanted to talk about uh, about them. So the first one was Ummani Peme Hong remix Chen Rezik Jan. Um, yeah. Yeah, that started with the song opens with. Uh, a melody of Om Mani Padme Hung that His Holiness started to uh, sing. I want to say around 2013 or so. Mm -hmm. I don't know the precise date, but you know it, it's his own melody. And I remember um, doing. I so I practice at Karma Triana Dharma Chakra Monastery in Woodstock, New York, which is His Holiness's North American seat. And we do a lot of Chen Rizik practice there daily. And then, um, at least back then, we were doing anywhere from two to four Chen Rizik retreats a year. And we would sing that melody, you know, in, in our sessions. And I remember um, one of my teachers, Lama Kathy Wesley, who was leading the Chen Rizik retreat, had said, you know, how auspicious, and, and I'm going to use the word powerful. I don't know if she used that word. It was but it, very powerful to hear a melody that was sung by His Holiness, whom we consider to be an emanation of Chen Rezi. So uh, in addition to the power of the mantra, we had that melody coming from the mouth of this great one. And so I, I don't know if, if it was in one of those retreats that I started to spontaneously hear in my dreams another melody that, that went that was very western and contemporary but also went with what his holiness had sung so mm -hmm. the track that we released is a combination of his holiness's melody and then this other more western melody that uh, you'll hear on the song and i remember uh, so when I was making these recordings, I, I wanted to make sure that Kempo Kartar Rinpoche was alive at the time. And I was nervous about recording mantra because I'm, you know, I'm just a practitioner. I'm a human with flaws. And part of me was thinking, well, is it, is it appropriate for me to record these mantras? 
uh, especially His Holiness, his melody, I was having kind of, um, I guess, concern. And so uh, I uh, requested an audience with Rinpoche. And I, I forget exactly what was said, but he requested that I uh, give him copies of the demos and he would listen to the melody and make sure that you know, that they were um, suitable or had the correct, you know, there's a yogic word nod, you know, the sacred sound current. And, you know, maybe just to make sure that this was, this would be a, a worthy addition to the sacred sound current. So um, he did give his approval. And I remember singing it for Rinpoche at KTD. And he was, you know, at this time he, I think he had a walker, you know, he's sitting on his chair, leaning on his walker and, and the music has a groove, right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> so he, he was nodding his head, you know, with his beautiful, kind smile, getting into the groove. And then his nephew, Lama Karma, who, who was, a, I think, president of KTV at the time, he was, Lama Karma said, is good. Okay. <laughs> you know? so that was my, that was my seal of approval. And so I was very grateful for that. And then when we eventually got into the recording studio, I asked Lama Karma and also Lama Tendup, who is the uh, shrine keeper. I know he has a more formal title um, in Tibetan. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but our master keeper of the shrine. And so uh, Lama Tendup and Lama Karma came into the studio and they sang at the beginning, they sang His Holiness's Melody. And I remember I'm going to cry even thinking about it. It's, it was so beautiful that the producer and I, I was lying on the floor, like outside the sound booth, just crying, just just these sweet tears of, I guess, purification because the purity in their voices was very healing. And, and you know, the producer kind of had the same feeling of awe and, and relaxation, just listening to them sing and so that's a moment that always stays in my mind a, a moment of real beauty in the recording process just the way i was i was literally like flattened i was prostrating on the floor listening to them and so i'm, I'm very grateful that they took the time to do that and i would imagine that when people are feeling the resonance of that music that a lot of it is because you know, those two wonderful llamas were in the recording studio with us. And um, Lama Karma, we asked him to do a, um, on his own a more rapid version of Omani to kind of replicate what you would get, you know, when everybody's, when everybody is in practice together, like Omani Dami, Omani Dami, Omani Dami. We wanted to capture some of that. And uh, we ended up, with this wonderful, there's a section of this song where you hear Lama Karma chanting in, in sort of a melody, and we added drums and guitar, and, and so it's when I when I was talking about the music having a groove, it's really like that section of the song. So we call it uh, the Lama's rap. <laughs> <laughs> That's like yeah, he likes to hear that. Um, and the Lamas also sang on Gate Gate Paragate, and just a few uh, seconds of that actually made it onto the recording. But at some point in the future, I hope to um, turn other um, sections of that original Gate track into something new because once again, they sang beautifully and we were in awe, you know, it, awe and such gratitude to hear their voices it's wonderful to hear uh the the elements that came together and the you know getting the approval that approval process lends so much weight to what is happening when it's being created and heard and when people are chanting along and 
you know, even if it's at home, they're listening to your music. Um, it, it brings it into people's homes. So it's really beautiful to hear um, how, uh, you know, when something, in, uh, the sound, uh, the, the, I should say the tune uh, spontaneously arose in your mind. And then there was still that process of combining His Holiness's tune, your tune, uh, checking with uh, your teacher, Kempo Katha Rinpoche, involving some of the lamas, and it's very lovely to hear that. Um, for yes, somebody who then, listens to your music, it's lovely to hear that background. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you know, I haven't thought about it in a long time. It, it was a long process, but it was very, it, it always felt very holy and and sacred and of course this is to me it's very sacred music so um and there was a lot of musicians involved who added to the track as well yes. so um and i was working with two very talented producers with really high level of musicianship so that was also you know a wonderful part of it that they could add to the sound current as yeah. well and you know it, tried to find as many Buddhist practitioners as I could. Uh, not that I wanted this to be a strictly, you know, Buddhist only project, but just people who like because on the one hand, music is is a meditation. Like like I think the most um pure musicians are the ones who lose themselves in the music. And when you lose yourself you're also dropping the ego. Well, um, and the labels, any label, I guess, uh, right? You know, uh, Buddhist or not? Yes, yes. So just, I, I really, um, so I think I should say rather than um, looking for only Buddhist musicians, it was more. I was looking for musicians who had the capacity to drop the ego as much as possible. Well, you know, it's hard to do in music because you also have to listen with your mind, right? Um, as you're recording, you know, is how is this note? You know, I'm speaking as a singer, but you know, musicians are also that you you get lost and you drop the mind and you drop the ego, but you're also, as I said, just slightly aware that um, you're using the right side of the brain, the left side of the brain, and then you're also offering everything up to the guru. So, like, it's a very specific place that a, a musician is in working with those things like the the critical mind no personality at all and then the guru do you know what i mean i do <laughs> i what came to mind is when i if i not that i do this often but when i see somebody surfing it, they catch a wave yeah and if they wanted to be egocentric i don't think they would be able to stand up on the board for as long that's they, such a good analogy right? they go with the wave and so yeah. they become part of the wave they don't become separate to the wave you know and so i think um that it's something like that that if one separates oneself from the experience then the then the experience is not going to be as as uh uh profound or um it's not it, it, it uh the personalization the identity if the identity a sense of identity is strong then one can't flow there isn't that natural expression um something That's really well said there's an I mean, I think yeah i think ultimately what i'm trying to say is that that the mantra takes over when you're recording this kind of music and also the yidam you know, takes over when we're recording this kind of music. Does that make sense? It does. I, I think, you know, um, uh, I mean, mantras, in a way, there's an aspect of a mantra that uh, is doesn't, is not full of meaning. It's not, it's not a word like beautiful, mm -hmm. or it's not a word like enlightenment. So in one sense, it has, it doesn't have the same meaning that a A word that's used in ordinary language has but but more than that I think it's it's the idea of effortlessness 
um, that if we try to put um, if we try to impose a relationship with the mantra and the deity, the yidam and so forth, then it's there's a lot of effort being put into something that isn't part of the mantra and the relationship or something like that. It's it's very this is very hard thing to articulate, isn't it? What yeah. your your process is. Mm -hmm. Um because, because ultimately the job of the musician or the singer, at least as, as I experience it, is to get out of the way. Right. And as you were talking, I was also reminded of the fact that I'm singing in Tibetan, which is not my native language. And so there was a part of my mind that was always um, kind of on my shoulder watching to make sure my pronunciation was, was as pristine as it can be. Um, the recordings that I'll be doing... Um, in the future, I'm going to be singing the 21 praises to Tara in Tibetan. And, and of course, that's it'll be challenging for me because, again, uh, I was raised in the West, in the U.S., um, very much in a, in a perfectionist model. So, uh, and as all you perfectionists out there know, that can be like a very destructive, <laughs> can be a very destructive force in the mind. So, yeah, so just again being aware of the pronunciation but also not aware you know that, again it is hard to articulate because it's really really such a fine line yes yeah okay. for for a westerner letting so something say, into that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes well it's all those elements and then letting the uh chanting flow through oneself as you mm -hmm. say, not getting in the way of what is happening while keeping that um, high standard that you bring to your music in terms of the, the detail and the pronunciation and so on. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of moving parts, really. Yes. And this reminds me, I did work with um, another one of the lamas at KTD, to, who, a native Tibetan, just to would, would send her recordings and say, you know, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? <laughs> and she would always say, yes, it's okay. Now, Lee, I love your album, Beyond the Beyond, a, man, uh, a mantra mix experience. Um, and I hope anybody listening to this will um, go on online and download it. It's really very, very special. Um, as music, as a, a spiritual journey, uh, an aid to meditation. I think it's wonderful. But I believe, and I'm very excited about this news, that A Secret Sky, your next album, you're working on that at the moment. Yes, yes. I'm excited mm -hmm. about that. You know, with yeah. the, the pandemic, a lot of that was put on hold, at least um, here in the U.S. or at least in New York where I live. There was a long period of time where I think all of the recording studios had to shut down because um, singing is a super spreader right. of, of the virus, apparently. So, and a lot of people, as you probably know, a lot of musicians started to set up their own home recording studios and start doing live streams and all that. But I am not that technologically uh, skilled. <laughs> so uh, recording myself I just haven't uh, I haven't mastered that so I will be on Thursday this week going back in to start resuming that so recording medicine Buddha uh, in Sanskrit and is that because of the need for healing in so many ways at the moment with this Yes, coming, hopefully coming through the pandemic and any other disturbances throughout the world. It's really to help the healing process. Absolutely. And I started to, uh, before the pandemic, uh, when I was doing live events, I was singing that. And so there's um, people who have requested it, which is also a nice um impetus it's a nice inspiration when someone has actually made a request you know to to honor that request so 
and then I'll be doing some Tibetan medical mantras <clears throat> from the Soa Rigpa tradition, which are again healing mantras. Yes. As you said, you know, with with the aspiration of really helping people, um, because as we know, people need that right now. Yes. And then, uh, as it, I will be attempting to record the Twenty One Taras in Tibetan, and wow. as I said, I will work with a Tibetan vocal coach to make sure that I can get the pronunciation as accurate as possible. Well, we eagerly await, await uh, the, the release of A Secret Sky. That sounds wonderful and, as you say, very much in, uh, in tune with what's needed at the moment. Thank and, you. Um, yeah, it was, it's been so wonderful to put the documentary together and have such a generosity from different people around the world with their music. And um, it, it was lovely that your music could be featured. Um, uh, and Such one an thing, honor. Well, if there's one thing that I, uh, I was very inspired about Learning a little bit more about you, Lee, is that um, that you have included um, aspects of Hinduism, aspects of Sufi. That the the idea that if one say does is a Buddhist or or something like that, but they do yoga or they are attracted to different types of uh, music or uh, different types of teachings or whatever. That, that things can become a little, um, feel like there's se separate laneways that one is in, in a way, or maybe martial arts, or there's a lot of different things that we uh, can be attracted to. Um, and from a, a musical perspective, um, you seem to have uh, the, the integration of the different um, uh, traditions seems to be quite seamless. I was, in terms of your own I don't know, spiritual journey or experience. Um, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in um, what you feel is happening there, um, uh, something like that. Um, well, I'll just start by um, saying that I was uh, raised in the Catholic tradition in the States and I have Catholic friends who went to Catholic school and, and really, really um, went dove deep into it. And my mother was actually a Catholic nun. And my father was um, studying, he was in seminary, studying to be a Catholic priest when they met. Um, my mother had done a years in, in a silent order and then um, came out and was deciding whether to continue or not. And my father, ooh, I'm getting chills when I say this. My father was also kind of deciding whether to continue with his uh, path of priesthood. And then they met and married and, and et cetera. Um, so I was raised in this Catholic household and I never quite took to it. Uh, even when I was very young, I had an understanding that this wasn't my first life, even though I had no language for that, because Catholicism doesn't have reincarnation, and yet I knew I did. So, and I kept that very quiet. You know, I didn't have. It wasn't like I wasn't in a family where I could have uh, verbalized that and have had like a a debate or anything. I just was like my my secret was that like I know this isn't my first life. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I when I went to college, um, I had the freedom to choose my own path. And so I started, um, and even like before that, I was reading uh, Carlos Castaneda. I was reading Autobiography of a Yogi. I was reading Ramdas, uh, which were texts that were somehow available to me. Like I look back on that, I'm like, how did I? How did autobiography of a yogi come into my hands? I, I grew up in a very white um, suburb, Christian suburb of 
of Massachusetts. It wasn't diverse. Right. And back then in, in the 80s, it, you know, we didn't have the same kind of diversity that we have now. And I know I'm giving you a long answer, but this is all to say that, so I started to really seek. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm not a Catholic anymore because I don't live with my parents anymore. And so I'm going to find my, find my tradition. And so that included yoga and learning the Hindu chants, uh, Hatha yoga, and also Kundalini yoga, which um, includes a lot of the Gurbuki chants. I, uh, I remember in graduate school, I studied, uh, I went to graduate school for creative writing and I studied Native American literature. And so I also studied a lot of uh, Native American ritual and ceremony and, and also the chants. So um, long story short, I was chanting and singing in a lot of different traditions and you know, loving it all and resonating with it all, which I think is the power of mantra that you don't necessarily, I mean, I'm not, obviously I'm not a realized being, so I feel that I didn't necessarily need to know what the mantras mean at a certain extent or, um, even like I just personally felt that, that it was okay to practice in all of these different traditions. Yes. You know, since then I've heard teachers say that, you know, it's better to dig a deep well than a number of small holes. And eventually I did, um, once I uh, stepped onto the Buddhist path, that's what I knew. I knew right away that this was my, my path, my tradition. And so really from that point on, I was immersing myself mostly in, you know, Buddhist chanting in, in context of Vajrayana. And uh, then also at the same time, I was singing Kirtan, which was becoming very popular in the West with, you know, community gatherings of people singing divine names and sacred chants. And for the most part, those Kirtans are in um, Sanskrit. Uh, so I think what I want to say is that, like, I resonate with all of those chants. And for this, for Beyond the Beyond, my uh, distributor is Spirit Voyage Records. And Spirit Voyage Records, uh, not exclusively, but primarily, uh, puts out chants from the Kundalini Yoga tradition in oh. Gurmukhi. So I did want to include a Gurmukhi chant to honor that label. Mm -hmm. And I did include uh, Govinda Hare in honor of a teacher who lived in the Woodstock area named Shamdas. And he was a teacher in the, in the Pushti Marg tradition, which is, um, follows Krishna. And she wanted to segue back to the film a little bit. I was very touched that you chose uh, the particular scene that you chose for Govinda Hare. It was actually a very tender scene. And that song, I don't know if you felt the tenderness of it, but this is another case where, so Shamdas left his body very suddenly, maybe six or seven years ago. He was riding a motorcycle in India uh, in January. I remember it was January. And so and there was an accident and he died very suddenly. And, you know, I had a connection with him as a friend. And also as um, kind of a, a fellow kirtan singer. In, in those communities. And I also really, you know, I really loved him. And so maybe two or three nights, he used to sing that song, Govinda Hare. And I should make a shout out to Krishna Das because I used to think that it was Sham Das's melody because he sang it all the time. To me, it was his signature chant. And then come to find that um, it's actually Krishna Das's melody. So I was doing a cover of a Sham Das version of the Krishna Das song. Okay. But the original melody is Krishna Das. So pronouns to him. Yes. And so, so shortly after he passed, I started to hear that song, that melody. And I heard very specific instrumentation. I heard a toy piano and a harmonica. 
which is kind of strange. I mean, logistically, it's kind of a strange combination of, of instruments to use, but I just went with it because that's how, that's how it came to me in the dream. And it felt, you know, it, it felt like a way of saying goodbye to his, him, him, his, him in his physical form, if that makes sense. So, so that's, I wanted to include that on the album as an homage to Shamdas. I, I agree with you, the importance of um, when one has a strong connection that we uh, go deeply into that. But that, yes. uh, that, but that doesn't have to lock out a, a broader, you know, experience. Um, Absolutely. Either, you know, so it's got that, you know, we never have to be so rigid. And I, I love that, mm -hmm. um, uh, your music is so expressive in that way. That, and, um, and honoring my teachers. Right. Because I haven't had a straight path. It's been very, you know, kind of circular. Or serpentine, I think, is the better word, right? And so, you know, for, for my my first project, I really just wanted to honor all of the um, the beings and teachers who helped me along the way. Lee, thank you so much for your time today and sharing so openly uh, the process um, by which uh, you somewhat enter into a place uh, that allows this beautiful music to flow uh, and, and the way you integrate uh, so many elements and aspects into your music. And so it really is a gift for us and uh, it's so wonderful that uh, you're part of the documentary that honors Trelik uh, Kjerbun Rumsh's life. Um, so I just want to thank you uh, for your time today and for being uh, on our YouTube. Uh, and um, uh, and just for anybody who's looking at this, we will have um, lots of links to Lee's um, uh, music for you. Um, so, you know, please uh, do yourself a lovely favor and uh, listen to Lee's music. And I thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Thank you.